The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. I guess so. Okay, as you will probably know, I'm going to be talking today about free NAS, and my first question is, how many people have, are like experts in free NAS? Good. <laughs> because if you were, this is going to be very uh, kindergarten. Um, so let me, let me try and get a sense of um, what people know about free NAS uh, from, a, from the perspective of what it does, not what it is. Um, who here would like to tell me what they think free NAS is? Go ahead. It's NAS software you put on an old machine. Okay, well, what's NAS? Network attached storage. Okay, so what would you do with your NAS server? The files are there, I don't want to spark up the machine, or I want to back up. Okay, uh, backup, as I heard. Um, file server, iSCSI target. File server, iSCSI, okay. Anything else? NFS, okay, that's good. Samba, CFS, anything else? Host I'm sorry? VMs. Host VMs, yep. Okay, well, that's uh, about 6% of what free NAS can do. <laughs> so it's a very versatile product, and one thing is, if anybody was in here for the last talk that Dan was giving about Linux from scratch, one thing I will say about free NAS is that it is... Uh, philosophically the, entirely the opposite. It is designed to make uh, BSD and the operating system behind FreeNAS completely invisible so you know nothing about it. Now, you can, because it is BSD, free BSD in fact, um, get into its internals and you could even make a full-blown free BSD server out of it, but that is entirely not its purpose. Uh, it's basically set up to be network attached storage. Basically every kind of network attached storage you can imagine. So what I'm going to start off with is I don't have any slides for this. I just wanted to hopefully show everything uh, live like it would happen on your own free NAS box. So the first thing you'll notice is that I'm using a virtual machine and I'm going to install free NAS on my laptop and then use it as if it were a computer out on the web somewhere or in your server farm or whatever. The download size you can see right here, 125 megs. So if you wanted to burn an ISO of it to install, that's how big it is, pretty small. Uh, you can actually run it as a fully functioning server right from the CD, it's a live CD. But for performance reasons, I would recommend that you install it. I mean, it's so small. You can do it in a virtual machine environment just like this. Um, I have it set for 256 megs of RAM. It doesn't need anywhere near that. Um, 
video memory is irrelevant because once you have it installed, it basically just sits in the background mm -hmm. and you never really worry about it again. You just worry about how you see the storage from all your other devices. So this is an install of FreeNAS. And this will probably be the fastest install of anything you've ever seen that was larger than an application. And hopefully it's not, hopefully it plays out that way and we're not all sitting here yawning waiting for this thing to install. I do have a backup of a live server that I can get to if I need to. <laughs> so. And this, this one right here that I have in this web browser, which is what you're going to see eventually when this all comes back up, is my live, one of my live FreeNAS servers back at home. So I'm, I, I'm just booting this, um, like was said before in the previous talk, uh, open, uh, sorry, VirtualBox, thank you. <laughs> VirtualBox allows you to uh, run an ISO as if it were a CD or a DVD straight from the file so you don't have to burn it and all that and waste all your time with that. Okay, so here we go. I'll go ahead and select boot. And now I could just run this like this. And FreeNAS would be up and running, no problems. But I'm actually going to do an install, just so you can see how quick it goes. And I would recommend that if you're going to run a FreeNAS server, whether it's in a VM environment or if you're going to have your own box, you do the install. You're not going to be wasting much of your time. And I'm seeing an XML file up there, so you can pre-configure? You can pre-configure, and inside the GUI, which I guess I'll get to it now. I was going to get to it later. But inside the GUI, you can actually download the XML file so that if you build another server, you can re-upload it, and it will reconfigure all your settings automatically. So option number nine up there is install. We'll do a full install from the CD to the hard drive. Let it pick all its defaults. Don't need a swap partition. And in about a minute, we'll have a free NAS server. You'll see that this is BSD underneath. You're looking at uh, BSD type uh, drive lettering, drive numbering. Have ATA drive zero slice one. Uses slices instead of, you know, partitions and stuff like that. But the nomenclature is pretty straightforward. And of course, once this actually installs, you'll never see this stuff again. Well, I take that back. You will, but it's easy. This actually tells you how, when your FreeNAS server comes up, to configure your disk inside of FreeNAS. So you don't even have to know how to do that. It tells you how to do it. So you could just copy this into a, uh, a text document or whatever and have it for when you reboot. The install is done, by the way. So I'm going to reboot. Actually, I'm going to shut down. And then I'm going to turn off the CD-ROM so we actually boot into the, the live system. And OK, it's down. So now I'm just going to go into the storage and virtual box, turn off the free NAS disk, give us no boot disk, start it back up again, now this should boot really fast, we'll see, make a liar out of me, now have a live FreeNAS server. That's all there is to it. Um, I, have, uh, I have this set to host only networking because I want to be able to access this virtual machine from my laptop. So all you have to do to configure that 
Just make sure this is set here to host only. And in here, set your LAN IP with DHCP. We don't need to turn on IPv6 for this. It'll get a DHCP address from VirtualBox. 192.168.56.101. Where's my, uh, I have to get, unlock my cursor. So I go to that address in the web browser, 56.101. There's the FreeNAS server I just installed, and you can see it looks exactly the same as the other one. So now we log into it, and the defaults are admin and free NAS to get into it, all lowercase, I hope. There we go. So here's what you see, and now the rest of, the, the rest of free NAS is driven entirely from this GUI interface to make everything super simple. What you're actually looking at here is the status and system from this drop-down. So the first thing you probably want to do is do some basic configuration on your system. Oh, and by the way, as far as what services it provides, it's these. <laughs> and it's not only a server for these, but it's also a client for some. So if you want to link, for example, two free NAS servers together by rsync so that they make copies of each other, you can do that. You can have, you can create an iSCSI target. In other words, you can have a, a device connect to this via iSCSI, or you can have this server connect to another SAN device via iSCSI and provide your devices with storage by proxy through FreeNAS. So one of the first things you probably want to do is go to the general setup. This is pretty straightforward stuff. You may want to change your host name, your domain name. You may want to set static IP addressing, which by the way isn't necessary because this also supports dynamic DNS. So if you don't happen to have a static IP address or don't want to spend the money on it or don't have any way to get one, you can still put this out on the internet using DynDNS.org or whatever, and always have access to it. Um, if you don't want your pa or your username for the web GUI to be admin, you can change it here. You can make this encrypted, automatically generate certs and everything, and of course, if you have your own uh, key and certificate, you can just cut and paste them here. Customize your port, et cetera. Change your time zone, it supports NTP, of course. Click on save, and away you go. And then this is where you change the password for your admin GUI if you also want to do that, which I definitely recommend because as you all know, FreeNAS is a default, and if you leave it that way, you will be hacked. There's a lot of stuff you can configure under your system in advanced. Things that you may want to set up immediately are a way for FreeNAS to email you because you can set it up to send you reports about its local devices, how much utilization it's getting, all kinds of stuff, which we'll get to a little bit later. But you know, you put in your information here, give it a test, and I guess I could just set mine up here. Free NAS at local. Make it secure since we're on the wireless network at a conference. So for best available. And and it fails. I don't know why. Probably because it doesn't like one of my settings. But anyway, you just test it. When you get a little green thing up there, you're good to go. And then any other settings later on that require email are already taken care of. Now, the next thing you have to do is set up the storage. 
because you want this box to be able to serve files or store files or whatever it is you want to do with this. So you go into the management and the first thing that you, the first thing that bugged me about FreeNAS when I did it myself for the first time was wondering what I'm supposed to do at this point. The little plus way over on the right hand side is not really in your face. <laughs> and there's really nothing else you can do on this screen. But once you find the plus, then <laughs> so, some of the, some of the you know, configuration things are just really subtle for no particular reason. You know, there isn't like a nice big button that says add disk, you know, click here, or something like that. But so in this case, we only have one disk. So we'll call it free NAS storage. And when we won't turn smart on or any of that stuff, you can see all the options you have here. Go ahead and add it. And then it says you must apply, apply, and now we have a disk. And this disk can be used to store or serve files from. But this is the whole disk including the, part, the bit that has free NAS on it. So we actually want to make a partition, which is what we did during the install. There were two partitions. One has free NAS and the other is sort of your blank storage. And we want to assign that now. So you go to your mount point. And again, there's that little plus over here on the right. And remember when I said it told you how to set up this partition? when you did the install, well this is the bit where you use that knowledge. So you pick the disk, and of course there's only one. It told you to use the MBR partition, and it was partition number two. Now it won't let you use partition number one because that's where FreeNAS is, and it'll say, I can't overwrite myself, so you don't have to worry about that, but use two, we'll call it data. We don't really want it mounted read-only because we probably want to store things on this drive. It makes the system a little more usable. And I'm going to set this to nobody and no group just so that all of the files that are stored in this partition are away from the operating system users and so forth. So we'll add it. And we have to apply. It says there's an error. Why is there an error? That's not happened before. Oh, now it's good. Okay. <laughs> Live demo, obviously. So, and of course you can F6 this drive if you want to. And if your system had more than one drive, you'd be able to access, yes. Did you, oh, I'm sorry. I saw a hand, I was like, okay. So uh, you can check your drive, make sure its consistency is good. Um, you can also unmount any drives you don't need or are going to service or whatever. But at this, yes, yes, this will actually handle software RAID right here under disks and software RAID. And uh, you know, once you have once you have two disks with partitions on them that you've predefined. You can assign them into a RAID 015 or any of those configurations there, and that will handle all the software RAID for you. And I think it says it even does LVM. Don't remember if it does LVM or not. Haven't done that myself. In fact, I haven't even used the software RAID. It also, as, as you can see here, uh, supports ZMF, ZFS pools. So if you're familiar with ZFS and you like pooling using ZFS, it supports that as well. Yes. Uh, I use FreeNAS cycling options for Windows 5. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got, I've got, at least at that time, it really didn't seem like you could do a very large scale with it. I mean, uh, my current file server is um, got uh, 32 terabytes using 2 terabyte drive. And I, from what I've seen, FreeNAS just can't handle that much data that is in the drive. And right now I run uh, SpinTalk. Could the updated version for FreeNAS be able to support 
Uh, the question was about the size of disk partitions that FreeNAS can handle, and I'm not sure in what way you mean that it can't handle a partition or. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any limitations in it. And also, this is version 7 of FreeNAS, which is the version I happen to use and be familiar with. But version 8 has recently come out. So anything that this lacks, version 8 may even support. So, yes? Um, if, if the FreeBSD kernel supports the, has a driver for that device, I see no reason why it wouldn't. As far as I know, it does, yes. Um, so. That, that's one I can't answer, unfortunately, about the eSATA, but I, I th believe it does. Yes? Yes, it does. Yes. Uh, it's not enabled by default, but it is installed by default. So I'll, I'm actually getting to the services bit of this right now, so I'll, um, well, let me, let me go through Okay, disk, so we showed you the management, showed you how you assign a partition, create data, et cetera, and everything's good to go there. Um, the land management's pretty straightforward. It's just like assigning IP addresses. If you have more than one Ethernet interface on your box, you can do things like port channel and stuff like that with this, so you can get faster speeds out of it. And then that's where the network management is. I don't think there's really enough time to go into all of the things you can do there. But since we're looking at services, let's start with SSH since that just came up. So here's one of those another subtle configuration bits about FreeNAS. Way over there on the right again, there's that little radio box for a uh, little checkbox for enable. And it's on all of these. And if you don't happen to see that off, all of these options are grayed out. So first thing you have to do is enable it. You want it on port 22, probably. I mean fairly safe, whether or not you could, basically what this is doing is configuring, you know, in Linux it would be under slash etsy slash sshd slash sshd underscore config. Basically this is the free BSD equivalent of that and all you're doing is configuring it via web GUI. So, and of course it, it uses keys, you can put keys in here. So now it says it has to reboot the system in order to enable SSH. So let's go ahead and do that. And when I do that, we can actually watch it reboot here. And then this won't take very long. So by default, all of these services are available to FreeNAS, but only none of them are enabled by default. <laughs> so anything you want FreeNAS to be able to do, and I think that's a good security model. You know, just have nothing available to begin with, and then you're forced to turn everything you want on. So we'll let it boot up here again. And with SSH enabled, you can now SSH into the box, and if you SSH in as a normal user, you can, well actually, there's a user dialog, so you can have somebody who has root access if you want, they don't need root access if you want, you can set their mount points, shells, Etc. just like any other Linux or BSD system. So one thing you might want to do is give yourself access to like the mount where all your data is. So if you want to be able to just go in there and use SCP or SFTP to pull a file off randomly, you can do that. Now, LAN IP address is still the same. I may have to log in again, though. 
said it was the same. 192.168.56.101. Oh, of course, it's HTTPS now because I enabled secure. So don't forget that. <laughs> And of course, it's a you know not properly signed certificate, so you'll have to do this unless you want to pay for one. So anyway, um, now you have SSH enabled. So if I SSH to 192, 168, yeah, you know, it's just like a normal server. I don't have any users set up. If you want to set up users, you have to go to access users and groups. Find the mythical plus. And then this, of course, is just configuring your uh, password file, shadow file, etc. So you can set up any users you want in here, give them what access you want, and all that. No, you, if, you, if you SSH into this box and want to update this stuff manually, you certainly can do that. But then if you wanted to do that, you probably wouldn't need FreeNAS. You could probably set all this stuff up on your own. It has, weirdly, support for Active Directory. So, <laughs> so if you want to set up your Active Directory domain and use LDAP for backend storage, or use uh, FreeNAS for backend storage, you can do that. Also supports Open LDAP for user authentication. Okay, well here's uh, another service you can enable, CFS or Samba. So if you want to have Windows shares, all you have to do is enable and set your work group. You know, the options are fairly straightforward if anybody's dealt with CFS or Samba before. I mean, you've all seen this before. This just gives you a layer of abstraction so you don't have to go into the smb.conf file and, you know, code all the blocks and everything. However, as you said, if you want to do it that way, you can. And uh, what's nice about it is if you do that, then when you come back to the GUI, all of this stuff will show up here. It's because all it's doing is giving you an overlay to the files underneath. I don't have a Windows box around here, so I'm not going to even bother with this. Uh, FTP. I think we all get FTP. You set it up, you specify you know, partitions that you can FTP to, you get FTP access to those files, real simple. Same with TFTP. You can actually write via TFTP and read from via TFTP. So if you have like a Cisco phones or some sort of routers that get their config files via TFTP, you can use this for that. NFS. I think, that was, I think that was one of the things that came up first when we discussed what you might use this for was NFS. Uh, so you set up an NFS share on here, you go to your local machine, uh, update your exports file, or not your exports file, your, uh, your FS tab uh, to reference an NFS share on this box and then you have direct access to that, the NFS. Sports Apple file sharing protocol. Don't know anything about this. If anybody wants to talk about Apple file sharing, go for it. <laughs> um, eh. Rsync is one. Um, it's sorry. It, okay, it supports Time Machine, the backups. Uh, Okay, you can do a backup, you can use Time Machine backup on your Apple devices uh, with AFP. So, that's cool. If anybody ever needs to do that, there you go. <laughs> um, rsync is, like I said before, it's a server and a client. So you can set this up with an rsync daemon. You just enable it, tell it what port, the default's 873. And then you can, on any box that has an rsync client on it, you can store files do mirrors, whatever you want. But of course, this can also be a client, so you can have it store its files somewhere else, maybe another FreeNAS server, maybe share it back to you, whatever you want to do. Is anybody unfamiliar with rsync? That's good. 
Is anybody familiar with Unison? Because I don't know what it is. <laughs> Okay, kind of like Dropbox, but okay. But using, does it use R sync? Mm, I don't think so. It's, it's its own protocol. It's yeah. Okay. Is there another comment about Unison? Okay, so, so you have a, an essentially a Dropbox like, Dropbox like situation with Unison. It's a bi directional R sync like protocol uh, that emulates Dropbox. Um, this, this is actually enabled, um, not enabled, but configured by default. So if you enable it, it's supposed to just work. Uh, presumably, you'd have to have another device that also supports Unison. And I don't know what those devices would be, other than another free NAS box. But. Clients for Windows and Okay, there are clients for various uh, OSs. Okay. Uh, I was going to spend a little bit of time on iSCSI because it's a little complicated. I'm not sure it's worth doing that, though. Um, one nice thing about iSCSI is there are, it's a standard that is supported by a lot of devices, and FreeNAS can support iSCSI in both directions. It can be an iSCSI target, and it can be an iSCSI initi initiator. So if you have a sandbox, for example, outside this box, that is able to um, terminate iSCSI. You can initiate an iSCSI connection from FreeNAS to that SAN and then offer it as local storage to FreeNAS so that all of your devices have access to the SAN. Now, that may or may not be necessary because you may be able to actually connect to that SAN device directly. But if you want to consolidate where you have all of your storage, you can, you can reference it here. And what, uh, what the iSCSI tar uh, target does is basically what you would do is if you had a device that needed storage via iSCSI, you could create a file in your storage path that encompasses, it's kind of like a VMware image iSCSI creates a file that is then represented as a directory or a storage area. And then any device that knows how to initiate a connection via iSCSI can see it and connect to it, and it will just show up like another file system on that device. But it's, it's actually a file, like I said, it's like an image file on the FreeNAS server. Um, it's a, little, it's a little complicated to set up, not because, not because it's that complicated, but because the way that uh, targets are named is things like this. And when you initiate an iSCSI session, you have to discover and directly reference that in order to mount it. So once you understand the nomenclature, it's not that big a deal, but you kind of have to get through the whole idea of the way iSCSI works. And one of the nice things about iSCSI is because, um, because this box and other boxes can use things like port channel, and iSCSI recognizes those as single e Ethernet connections, you can have very high-speed transfer across network storage devices using iSCSI almost as fast as something directly connected. Uh, as far as as far as Linux is concerned, this is uh, Linux Mint, which is basically Debian. Um, there's this package called Open iSCSI, and if you want to if you want to set up your your machine as a as a, an iSCSI target or as an iSCSI initiator, you would install this package. I assume it's similar for a Red Hat ish. Does anyone know what the iSCSI package is for Red Hat? iSCSI what? iSCSI initiator utils. Okay. I like open iSCSI. 
It's just called ISCSI. It's a meta package called ISCSI. Okay. So anyway, there's a there's a package for the for your OpenSUSE and whatever for uh, for ISCSI as well. Um, what this does for you is give you some utilities. Yes, I'll be rude. Which will discover any iSCSI targets that you can connect to. So here's a few of them here. And with a little bit of uh, command line foo, you can connect to this device via iSCSI, and you can set it to connect to it every time your system boots, so you don't have to do that ever again. It'll just do it automatically. And then you'll go into your FS tab, and you'll put in a line similar to this one down here at the bottom that references the iSCSI name of the storage device, where you want to mount it, what kind it is, say that it's a network device, and then whenever your system boots up, you will have a local file system called iSCSI1 that's as big as whatever size that partition is. And when you store it, when you store things on it, you're actually storing it on your free NAS server. Let's see, you can also set up authentication. iSCSI by default, I believe, uh, is unauthenticated. If a target is out there, you can connect to it, but here you can actually set up username and password authentication. So you don't, you can also limit by IP address and so on. UPnP. Uh, I find this really neat for things like your Xbox or XBMC or any other media services that support UPnP because you can put all of your movies or whatever, music, on your free NAS box, enable UPnP, and those things like XBMC and Boxy and all the other stuff that support UPnP, uh, they'll show up. <laughs> You'll have access to them automatically. Uh, it's pretty much as simple as enabling it, telling it which directory you want to serve. Presumably you'd have something called like media or something like that where all your movies are. And then any UPnP enabled devices will just find it and those files will be available. And not only that, but you can click down here, and then you will have port 49152, another web browser, you can, another web access you can go to with your browser to directly manage your media files. It'd be kind of like MediaTomb, and it may, actually, may in fact actually be MediaTomb, I'm not sure. <laughs> So UPnP, you can also have a remote DAP or iTunes library. So if you want to store all your music on here and have it accessible as a remote library in iTunes, you can do that. Although, you know, it's iTunes. Take it or leave it, I guess. Here's your configuration for dynamic DNS. If you want to use dynDNS.org for your serving so you don't have to have a static IP address for your free NAS box, then you set that up here. Pretty straightforward configuration for that. Now this uh, can be pulled as an SNMP device and it can also send SNMP traps to your SNMP trap server. If, for example, you're monitoring like disk temperatures using smart or file transactions or whatever, this can actually send those bits of information to an SNMP trap server so that you have instant notification when certain events happen. Uh, this is 
I'm not sure how applicable this is for like a home user setting up a free NAS box. Most people don't really get into SNMP. Um, so I'm not sure how deep into SNMP I should go. Is anyone interested in more information about SNMP? Or just making me happy so I don't have to say anything? <laughs> <laughs> FreeNAS can also monitor the UPS it's connected to. And going back to those SNMP traps and also the email bit you set up before, it can send you notifications if there's a power failure. It can send an SNMP trap if there's a power failure. And you can also get it to shut the system down in the event of a long power failure. So it'll actually monitor a connected U UPS device. It's pretty handy. And I think you'll notice that most of these things you can do as a, as a normal server or on a normal server. This just gives you a really easy way to get to all of this stuff that you might want to do normally. Well, this is weird. You're looking at a web, you're looking at a web, you know, browser, and there's a thing about a web server that's not enabled, <laughs> but it's here. Why is it here? Well, the reason it's here is because this can actually give you web access to your files on a different port than port 80 or 443, which is what we're on now. So you just set this up with, well, let's, let's not do HTTPS. Let's do port 8065. Make the document root. data, and we won't enable authentication because this is just a local box. I would, I would though, and when you enable that authentication, it uses the authentication you've configured before, whether you have local users, Active Directory, or LDAP. That's where it gets its authentication data. So now we've enabled that. We can go up here to 56, 8065. Did I give the right address? I did. Yeah, and then since there's nothing there, there's a thing where you can enable, I believe if you enable this, then it will, yeah, show us the fact that there's nothing there. <laughs> uh, and if, of course, there was something there, you would see it. And you can do direct HTTP transfers from this if you wanted to download a file or This last one is the one that I just recently discovered. And I think this is cool, especially if you like BitTorrent. Because if you enable this, then let's create a download directory. Data torrent. Um, I usually turn off distributed hash table. If you're into BitTorrent, you'll know why. If you're not, don't worry about it. Um, you can set your upload and download limits here for any files you want to serve via BitTorrent or any files you want to receive via BitTorrent. One thing I will say is that this is a global bandwidth setting. This is not per file. So if you set 50 kilobytes, that's for every transfer, not each one. So if you have two transfers going, it'll be 25 each. And also note that this is kilobytes per second, not kilobits per second. Most people, when they think about transfer speeds, it's in kilobits per second. So if you're thinking kilobits per, per second, divide by eight. <laughs> so if you want it to be 128 kilobits per second, divide that by eight. That's the number you want in here. In here, you can create a directory, and if you like SSH or FTP into the box and dump a torrent file into this directory, then it will automatically initiate the torrent. So you can do that. You might want to set an incomplete directory where it'll download your torrents first and then move them into the final destination when they're finished. And then it gives you a web interface. I 
hopefully this will actually work. Okay, good. <laughs> so if I go now to port 9091, put in my authentication data, which I just submitted, this gives you an interface to transmission, the BitTorrent client transmission. And what I think is, like I said, if it, there was anything in that directory, that watch directory, if you set it, the torrents would already be in here doing whatever they're doing. But what I think is neat about this is if I go to, for example, my blatant plug of my own website, I'm only doing this because I know there's a torrent here. <laughs> and I go to my torrent feeds. And I wish the network wasn't this slow. Okay, so this is a torrent file right here. I copy it. I open, paste that URL here. Is this just really slow or what? Try it one more time. Oh, it, it can't, this, the, the, uh, the host doesn't have networking, that's right, duh. <laughs> if the host had networking, <laughs> the, all your torrents would show up here and there'd be a progress indicator. And then once, once your um, torrent was done downloading, it would of course become a seeder. So this is an easy way to instantly set up um, a seeder box for any torrents you want to see. Let's see, let's go back here. Okay, so that's, that's all the things you can configure, and I'd be willing to bet that everybody in here can think of one of those things they'd like to do with a server at home, uh, whether it be the iTunes or media sharing or whatever it is. I, I use almost every feature that this has to offer. Initially, we showed the, uh, the system, shows you information about your system, how long it's been up, utilization, so on and so forth. Here's a top, rendered as a web page, show you what services are running. This is, a, this is a cool page right here. All of the things that you have configured and enabled and what status they're in, just give you a little red, you know, green check or red minus right here, your whole free NAS server at a glance. I do not, but let's see if it shows up in the, uh, in the process list. Nope, it's a little far down for that. Let me, uh, you can get a shell right here. Oh, anyone see a, I see transmission, light HTTP. Uh, it's probably, it's not running actually, is it? I haven't enabled FTP. So let's do that. So we'll enable FTP. I'm going to ignore all of the options for right now and hope I didn't need to set one. And of course I did. Yeah, okay, yeah. Parameters are added to proftp.com, so obviously it's proftp. Uh, you can re you can replicate using rsync, uh, but I don't think there's any uh, true cluster support that I, uh, the not not that I'm aware of. Um, there are there is the capability in FreeNAS for uh, loadable modules, so there may be a third party module that supports it. Yes. 
it does not that I'm aware of, but of course it's just a Linux box, so if you wanted to add a print server to it, or it's a free BSD box, sorry. So if you wanted to add a print server to it, you certainly could. But it doesn't do print serving in FreeNAS. Don't all printers have their own print servers now? All right. Um, so we, I showed you how to look and see what servers. Uh, here's a list of your active interfaces showing traffic, et cetera. Here's your disks. You can see basic information. If smart was enabled, you would see smart data as well. And then you actually have live utilization chart. You can see your interfaces, and you can see your CPU traffic. Yes? I could not, because I used this, and it did everything that I could ever imagine, and I never had to look anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, VFS alone, I think, makes this well worth it, but uh, I had a lot of issues with them, so that they run the amount of CPI up to date with current hardware, and it's, it's not as nice, it's not as well maintained by any means as this is. Um, email reports, you can uh, have this either run immediately, click a button, you get a report on the status of your system. You can also have it run periodically, like every day, whatever get updates on your system. You can do the same thing with your log. You can have this sent to you if you like. Any information that comes in like the boot log or the sys log. Um, basic information on all of your different things up here. Your disk, partitions, smart usage, software rate, iSCSI. You can get data on all of that stuff right from here. Uh, you can do some basic diagnostics with ping and trace routing for network connectivity, see your ARP tables, your static route settings. And then you have a basic file editor. So if you don't want to actually connect to the box and use VI or Emacs or whatever, which you would have to install, uh, you can edit files on the file system right from here. And then it uses the Quick Explorer file browser. So you can actually, this is kind of like the web access to your files, but a little bit fancier. This is all it really is. Gives you access on a different port. No. So, there you go. Basically, it just looks like the HTTP, HTTP access with a couple of fancier icons up here. This, this is probably, I think, the, like the silk icon set or whatever. Uh, and I believe you can actually move files around doing this and, and whatnot. Delete files, etc. So that, in the 58-minute nutshell, is FreeNAS. So I have like two minutes for any questions left over. Yes. Yes, there is. I didn't go into the network config stuff because I said it wasn't important. Well, guess what? It's probably important. <laughs> oh, look, it logged me out. And I didn't actually change that. Oh, that's, that's the other server, I think. No, no, it was the right one. I don't know. Anyway, yes, uh, there is firewall configuration right here. And um, what is the BSD firewall thing? It's what? PF, right. So this is configuring PF. So, uh, looks like I still have about a minute left, so yes? Are there any binaries in this or other kinds of boxes, like ARM boxes and the like? Uh, they, they do have an embedded ISO. I don't know what it runs on. I don't know if it's I386 only or if it will actually run on ARMs or anything like that. Does anybody know if it runs on any other platforms? Probably just I386. Yes. Oh, 
Okay. Comment was that in version 8, the latest version, uh, support for things like iTunes and Unison have been removed. BitTorrent's been removed as well? Okay. So use version 7. <laughs> All right. Anything? Yes? Not that I'm aware of, but they could be out there. I, I was just going over the, you know, what's built into it. I mean, but there is module support out there. I don't know what's been written. No time for one more, maybe? Yes. I don't know. Do you know if, if uh, eight is supports RAID six? <coughs> CFS RAID six in eight. I guess that's my time, so thank you very much. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.